Pongpong is training some students from his school to participate in the national championship for monster trainer students, and Gao's familiar, Beiji, seem to be dominating the battle. Frustrated, Ji Yu Ji Ya and Ah Li send out their pets to stall. The former has his pet, Devil Vine Mountain Climbing Monster, using the restriction skill. Not even five minutes in and we're back at it with these ridiculous names. Beiji stands in place as the plant-based monster's vines hold him in a death grip. But there's one fatal flaw in this approach, one that Gao Peng instantly takes note of. Despite their decent teamwork, they've just made an attempt to control a wood-type familiar with a lower-level familiar of the same type. Well, time for them to get wrecked. The second Beiji opens its eyes and gets anything close to serious. The vine monster's position is reversed and it's trapped in fresh vines. Glancing toward Cao Huan, Gao Peng wonders what she'll do since her storm cloud sparrow is their only chance of victory now. Surprisingly, she actually raises her hand and admits defeat, shocking her classmates to their core. As they question her decision, Gao Peng makes it known that her familiar did stand some chance of victory, even if a slim one. So why did she surrender? She replies that her familiar's grade was raised by him in the first place, so whether she fought or not was unimportant. What? How does that make any sense? This seems to satisfy Gao Peng as he then tells them he wants to show them the importance of levels with this beatdown of a battle. For the next six days, he intends to shove such intense training down their throats that they're all the trainers of Lord Tier Familiars at the very least. Naturally, the students are gobsmacked by this claim and yell out their shock. Gao Peng doesn't give them a single extra moment to think though as he pulls out a whole shelf of goodies and tells them he's prepared a small gift. Instantly, one of their tiger familiars starts wagging its tail with love in its eyes over the materials. As the tiger's trainer tells it to chill the hell out, Gao Peng explains that these are all King Tier Monster Core Crystals, meant for their familiars to consume. Once more, the students are left speechless by Gao Peng's statement. Gao Peng simply narrows his eyes and tells them that he has everything from precious treasures to evolution materials and power-ups. Half a month later, we see Gao Peng at Modu Airport. Gao Peng is just walking through the place with his academy's representatives when two of the Tongs he crushed way back when spotting him. The man, Tong Xiang, is fixated on his desire for revenge on Gao Peng for what he did to them. His friend, Tong Ling, tries to talk some sense into him, reminding him that Gao Peng is far beyond their level. When Xiang insists on this being their chance for vengeance since his familiars aren't here, she just walks away and tells him to keep her out of it. Smart move, honestly. As for Gao Peng himself, the man is busy reuniting with the man he knows as Uncle He, who has gone from being mayor to the president of the Freedom Alliance in these past years. The man remains humble despite his position though and talks to Gao Peng like an old friend. While speaking of grabbing some lunch together next time, he leans in and whispers a warning to Gao Peng about several groups in Mo Du who want to end his life. Gao Peng just thanks him and casually tells him that his student's safety is in the president's hands. While he's walking away, President, he wonders if his confidence is from an ace up his sleeve or just incredibly good control of his emotions. Both, both are good. At Modu Stadium, the startup announcements are being made for the beginning of this latest college championship. The first students entering the field are the representatives of the previous year's winner, Huwa Wu High School. As they enter to uproarious applause from the crowd, Yao Peng speaks to his students. He reminds them, this is what it means to be a champion, and this is how their juniors will be treated next year if they win. While the others are waiting nervously for their turn with this on their minds, the little stout guy has a different concern. If they bring glory and honor to their school by winning the championship, can they be excused from the exams next month? You know what? I respect the hustle. Not everyone is quite as positive though, as a girl from another high school instantly starts belittling Stouts, pointing out that his academy only plays 8th last year. Stouts is visibly upset by this and goes to yell back at her, but the girl barely even bats an eye. Just asking where a loser like him got such confidence. Jeez, really leading into the douchey villain trope. As her group walks away, Gao Peng stops Stout from doing anything further and tells him that they must be from Luoyang High School based on their uniform. The best thing to do is just wait and crush them in the next round. Meanwhile, the announcer for the championship has been revealing the drawings for each match. The current drawing, the third one, turns out to be Luoyang High versus Gao Peng's Tian Ga Academy. Talk about convenience. Inside Luo Yang High's waiting room, one of the main players laments their bad luck in their first match drawing. After all, just last year, T and Gu's leader could have caused them to not even get placement if his familiar wasn't mauled by Ji Nun College in the preliminaries. The rude chick from before is quick to speak up though and tells everyone that Li Junzong, their leader from last year, isn't even here this time. 
They can totally crush T and Gu's team. Meanwhile, the atmosphere is pretty similar in T and Gu's waving room, if a little more excited thanks to Stout's and Kaki's enthusiasm. Yeah, I'm just gonna keep going with these nicknames. Cal Huan acts as the voice of reason though and tells the boys to calm down and study the next match between Hu Hua Wu and Ching Mu since Hu Hua Wu is their true biggest threat. She gets to keep her name, she's respectable. Gao Peng watches from the door with pride at Cao Huan's unintentional leadership qualities and the team's newfound confidence as a whole. Suddenly, an upset occurs on the TV tuning into the match being broadcast. They're shocked to see that Hu Hua Wu has only sent out two representatives for this match. Kaki is super peeved by this as it's disrespectful to their opponents but obviously, they can't hear him through a TV. Gao Peng on the other hand is busy studying the stat window of the two familiars with the Hu Hua Wu kids. Known as the Light and Dark Wolf of Ji Li Wilderness, he's pretty sure they're not even from Earth at all. This has the Hushan Group and the Hu Hua Shia region's military department written all over it. As the match begins, Gao Peng watches on to see the twin wolves dashing forward at insane speeds and releasing elemental light from their mouths. Their opponent tries to get his raging giant hammer ape to put up a decent defense, but it ends up being completely ripped through in a matter of moments. Before anyone can even think to react, the wolves have torn three of their opponent familiars to bloody shreds. As the crowd goes wild with cheers, Gao Peng just slowly claps like a cartoon villain. He's just glad there will be an actual challenge for his own students here. Something they are not enthused by at all. Next up is Tian Gu vs. Luo Yang. The commentators take their time explaining how Gao Peng has returned after three years of absence to lead this year's team. Over in their prep area, Stouts asks Gao Peng if they should just send out two familiars as well to assert dominance. Though he has confidence, Gao Peng doesn't want to leave anything to chance and tells them to keep their cards close to their chest till the finals. He turns to Cao Huan and shares his strategy with her on how to handle the current match. With a combination of her Cloud Sparrow Storm Cloud Sparrow and the Devil Vine Mountain Climbing Monster, they should be able to end things without ever revealing their trump cards. All the students are very approving of Gao Peng's sly ways, though he maintains it's just strategy. Over in Hu Hua Wu Hai's waiting room, their coach is gloating over how Tian Gu is weak and will lose with their subpar familiars trained by the subpar man that is Gao Peng. There's a reality check just waiting to happen. On the arena floor, Tian Gu's team faces off against their opponents with the planned familiars in place. The commentators are quite confused by Tian Gu's decision to put forth the wood type as their front line considering the low defense of such types and the fire type of their opponent. The snarky chick from before actually senses that something is off and warns her teammates before the match starts. As soon as things are underway, Stouts has devil vines spread out multiple vines to seize the terrain. Something which Luo Yang tries to punish with flame, only to learn the shocking fact that Stouts' devil vine is somehow immune. Just then, the commentators voice their theory about this situation. Considering the fire immunity and the number of vines released by this familiar, it seems to have already reached Lord Tier. As the rest of her teammates freak out over the opponent's familiar being a Lord Tear, a snarky chick tries to regain control of the battle. She sends out her thousand leaf mantis to cut off the vines before spreading, causing it to lunge forward with a full-powered smash from its blade-like arm. Unfortunately for them, this barely even puts a scratch into the vines of the Devil Vine. From the other end of the arena, Stouts smugly tells Devil Vine to take them all down. With a devastating application of the skill called Strangling Vine Ocean, the Devil Vine does just that and the battle is over before it can even truly begin. The snarky chick forfeits the moment she and her teammates feel their familiar's vital signs fading. Well, at least they're good trainers, I guess. With their victory, the Tien Ga Academy students have shocked the crowd and put themselves back in the public eye after last year's defeat. Something that's compounded even more by the fact they did it with just a single familiar. From his spot, Gao Peng smiles at all the students and notes that the Luo Yang girl made the right choice. Since this is just the qualifier match, they're better off conserving the energy of their pets for later. Later that night, Gao Peng exits the arena to meet a driver sent by President He to get him. When his students ask if he's not coming with them, Gao Peng smiles sinisterly and tells them he has something to take care of. Even later that night, Gao Peng heads out onto the streets and gets into a taxi. He asks the driver to get him to a quiet spot and puts on the news. The only information on there is incredibly grim. Not only are spatial distortions of increasing magnitude expected soon, but new monsters are also appearing. Gao Peng ponders on it all and thinks about how monsters were fierce beasts in the early days after the cataclysm and are now living among humans. Unlike the people of Earth, 
Gao Peng has learned the truth from the Black Fa world. Considering that truth, he wonders if the ancient tribes are really as omnipotent as they like to claim. Well, that's some foreshadowing if I've ever seen any. Suddenly, the taxi comes to a halt outside a seemingly random spot with the sound of tides nearby. Gao Peng notes that the place is definitely quiet. Just then, the taxi driver asks a generic question. In response, Gao Peng reveals he knows the man isn't a real taxi driver. The man introduces himself as Yin and tells him he's here with an invitation for Gao Peng to join the Yuhu tribe. Upon Gao Peng's skepticism, Yin claims that his clan only recruits those of the highest potential. Gao Peng sees right through all the flattery and bullcrap though and calls him out for his tribe being in desperate need of help of some sort. Offended and annoyed, Yin tells him the Southern Sky Group will pay for his words today. Gao Peng simply asks him to answer one single question. Why are they targeting Tian Ga Academy constantly if they want to recruit him? Wait, what? I must have missed something. Before Yin can respond, Tong Xiang shows himself from behind a tree and explains that this is just the way of the ancient tribe. Any tribe is weaker than theirs is to be taken over by their enemies by default. Gao Peng is on guard at once as he states that the Tang tribe is in on this. Xiang quickly assures him though that that's not the case. He's just mad at Gao Peng, so he's here to watch Yin end him as a spectator. Huh. Well, that's something. Xiang also mentions that the White Dragon tribe won't send anyone to help him since his grandpa refused their recruitment. Rather than being concerned by any of this, Gao Peng just calls out five of his weaker familiars and tells them he doesn't need the White Dragon tribe. Rather than being intimidated, Yin just laughs at him for only having five familiars out here. Gao Peng just tells him that only King Tier monsters can be born here thanks to Earth's limit restrictions, so what else would he need? This seems to be just what Yin wanted to hear as he starts going feral with claims of how it's a special day today. Sure enough, just moments after he says that Gao Peng senses an overwhelmingly strong spatial turmoil, he instantly realizes what this means. The monster level limits of Earth are about to increase. Yin hops up to a tree branch above his position and starts bragging about how Gao Peng probably hasn't seen an Emperor Tier familiar before. Oh boy, is he in for a surprise and a half. With that said, he summons his familiar, a barbarian Emperor Mountain Breaker. Gao Peng's busy reading the status window of its supporting familiar, a level 60 meteorite magic ball, when Yin mistakes his silence for fear. He tells him he'll give Gao Peng a chance by only using his supporting familiar. Plus, he'll wait 10 minutes so Gao Peng can run and the further he gets the less Yin will hurt him. Internally, Gao Peng is just stumped at how cocky the guy is when he hasn't even shown his own cards yet. Not to mention the meteorite ball thing is clearly rarer than the mountain breaker with the ability to possess living beings. That's the glow around Yin's limbs. Yin takes offense to the fact that Gao Peng is refusing to run and shoots a beam attack at him. Dummy's daughter blocks this with only minor injuries which Flowery is quick to kill. Yin retains his smugness from inflicting that injury though and starts talking about how Gao Peng should just stay under the radar if he wants to live to reach his true potential. The man in question just laughs in Yin's face and tells him he lacks imagination. With that, he snaps his fingers and summons forth Slicey, who now dons an impressive set of black armor shell. Yin instantly recognizes the bladed beast for the Emperor Tier it is and he's blown away that Gao Peng managed to get a familiar that high in just three years inside the Black Fa world. Brother, you don't know the half of it. Yin worriedly sends forth his mountain breaker and whines about how his original plans to toy with Gao Peng have been ruined now. Womp womp loser. The second the mountain breaker gets near Gao Peng's location, Slicey takes off in a burst of speed and slashes the larger beast's arm to ribbons. Then, from his position in the sky, Slicey leaps downwards toward Yin while he's still in shock and slashes his arm as well. Luckily for him, he's able to use his special skill life-saving teleportation in the nick of time to escape. Well, sort of escape. He only gets so far before Gao Peng instantly catches up to him and turns the tables. Now he has 10 minutes to run. Yin knows he's done for and starts groveling and begging to be spared. When he promises he'll stop his tribe from making trouble in the future, Gao Peng just tells him there won't be a Yuhu tribe left in the future. With that, he steps away to tell Tang Xiang that they need to talk since he knows more about Yuhu. Once he has his back turned, Yin yells that he forced his hand and sends Mountain Breaker forward to attack once more. Tong Xian points out that Yin is flying away but Gao Peng just casually says that he won't make it far. Sure enough, right as Mountain Breaker gets close, Gao Peng summons Dragon Ant number 3, the Power King Kong Ant, 
As a level 68, he easily stops the Mountain Breaker and proceeds to smash him into the ground hard enough to make Akaju jealous. From behind him, Tong Xiang can only be grateful he decided not to openly oppose Gao Peng. Up in the air, Yin is sure he's safe as long as he's airborne. That belief is shattered moments later when Slicey is launched into the air like a cannonball and twists in a tornado of bladed fury to shred Yin into a bloody paste. Afterward, Gao Peng amusedly watches Dragon Ant number 3 and Slicey's antics. Suddenly, Slicey rushes his way and brings out Yin's meteorite ball, saying that he found it. Tong Xiang is utterly flabbergasted by how casually Gao Peng just summoned two Emperor Tier familiars. Oblivious to Xi'an's worldview being shattered, Gao Peng just examines the meteorite ball thingy that Slicey's brought over to him. He holds up the moderately injured orb to Xi'an and asks him what it is. The Tong tribe member answers that it's known as the Starry Magic Ball. Gao Peng is interested in how he calls it by a different name than the system itself does. Tong Xi'an goes on to elaborate on how the ball is a familiar and not an object. They, the ancient tribe members, are only capable of signing one familiar contract at a time. Training the Starry Magic Ball allows them to access the skill of another familiar because of its possession ability. Realizing how valuable it is to the people of the ancient tribes, Yao Peng slyly asks Xiang if he would like to have it. When the green-haired wonder expresses his surprise, Gao Peng tells him it's no big deal. After all, he'll get a bunch of them when he cleans out the Yuhu tribe. Xiang instantly gets on his case for that statement and rants about how the Yuhu has two overlord tier familiars, hundreds of emperor tiers, and thousands of king tiers. Unbothered, Gao Peng just asks him where the tribe is located. The man simply does not give a damn. Xi'an answers that it's in the Ji Yuli wilderness in a spatial rift 20 kilometers away from Qingzhou Base City. While he offers to send the exact location later, he's internally hoping that Gao Peng and Yu Hu will take each other out. Just like that, Gao Peng casually tosses the meteorite ball over to Xi'an like a cheap toy and loops his arm around the shorter man's shoulder. They'll be going back together after all. Xi'ang instantly realizes he'll be screwed if the tons of cameras on the route spot him with Gao Peng. If anything happens to piss off the Yu Hu, his own tribe will get in trouble with them too then. Gao Peng goes on to ask him where his Song Tong tribe is located as well. Naturally, Xi'ang backs away and tells him he already told him what he wanted. Just what does he want with his tribe now? Gao Peng claims they're good friends now so he just wants to pay his hometown a visit when he gets the chance. Yeah, that was totally super convincing. Not weird at all. When all he gets from Xi'ang is a scoff, Gao Peng heads off and tells him he won't force him if he doesn't want to share that information. Later on the outskirts of Modu, Gao Peng is traveling atop his fourth dragon ant baby. The Aurora dragon ant is now a level 69 emperor tier beast. He speaks to his uncle he over the phone and asks him to take care of his students while he heads out to handle some things. The older man is happy to accommodate him, leaving Gao Peng free to work out his next plan. For one, he finds it odd that the ancient tribes are unable to sign more than one familiar contract at a time. Especially since they reportedly were able to do so many years ago but lost that capability over time after leaving Earth. He can only assume they were cursed somehow or there's something special about Earth's environment. Whatever the case may be, that's one of the main reasons you who wants to recruit talented monster trainers from Earth itself. They hope to expand and alter their own tribe's genetic composition by crossbreeding. For anyone who doesn't get it, they want to do the nasty with their folks. Soon enough, Gao Peng arrives near the spatial rift Tong Xiang told him about. Here he gets off the Aurora Dragon Ant and lands in front of a squad of guards, who demand that he go back where he came from. Of course, Gao Peng does no such thing and instead asks why soldiers from the Hua Xia region like them are acting as the Yuhu tribe's lackeys. This visibly cuts quite deep for the head guard, but he continues trying to get Gao Peng to leave. Just then, a new voice screams out like an angry baby throwing a tantrum. Gao Peng turns towards the source of it to see someone from the tribe itself along with his familiar. The guards refer to him as Master Yin Shi. The man speaks of some gene modification plan set by their elders that's using local women and threatens to have them all pay with their lives if it gets messed up. Gao Peng ponders the man's words and his familiar's stats before sending fourth baby out to take them down. The dragon ant baby unfurls his wings and displays his full glory before letting loose a long-range slash attack that defeats the blood-red crystal deer. The guards are all shocked that the deer was beaten in a single blow. Gao Peng turns to said guards and tries to offer them a way out since he doesn't want to hurt them. As he speaks to them, the cowardly Yin she runs back towards the rift to get back up. At his command to pacify Gao Peng till then, 
the head guard releases his iron-backed wolfhound. Except, to everyone's surprise, he sends the hound at Yin Shi instead of Gao Peng. With him incapacitated, the old guard tries to advise Gao Peng against risking himself and tells him to preserve his own life rather than fight the tribe. Confused by his exact words, Gao Peng asks what he's talking about and learns that the tribe has been kidnapping girls to enhance their genes. Pondering over their words, Gao Peng decides the soldiers are good people. As such, he offers them a place with the Southern Sky Group if they'd like to leave this post. There, they'll be safe. Stepping towards the spatial rift, he's got one foot in when he calls back to them. The Yuhu tribe will no longer exist after today. After stepping through the spatial rift, Gao Peng finds himself on a wide cleared path in the middle of a fairly spread out forest. He's just thinking about how it doesn't seem quite like the wilderness he expected when he spots some buildings up ahead. The tribe is right there. Well, that was convenient. Almost like someone wrote it to be that way. Before Gao Peng can really get on his way to the tribe though, a cloud comes to life and starts yapping at him about how he's a foreigner. Seems a bit rude, but okay. Gao Peng claims that he's from the Song Tong tribe to try and defuse the situation while discreetly reading the cloud's stat window. The level 64 giant cloud king recites a data entry about the Song Tong tribe being in a valley 300 lands away from here, causing Gao Peng to initiate his backup plan. Slicey comes flying through the air at lightning fast speed, with a move he calls True Death Ultimate Extermination Slash. In the span of a few seconds, he slashed the cloud to little more than wisps of vapor. Or rather, a cloud. He just slashed the one next to the Cloud King monster. He corrects that quickly though as the Cloud King is eliminated just moments later. Not sure what happened there, to be honest. Performance issues I guess, with the Cloud King dead, a large core crystal appears in its place. Before Slicey can stake his claim on the core though, the Aurora Dragon Ant Gao Peng is riding on chomps down on the thing. Gao Peng stops Slicey from fighting over it by reminding him that he'll get his fill soon now. Down in a building where one of the tribe's elders is lounging, he suddenly suffers massive damage due to the Cloud King's death and desperately tries to move out and warn the other elders. His efforts appear to be in vain though as Gao Peng is already making his move above the tribe. He summons Strepi up in the air above their settlement, causing him to come down like the meteoric fury of a god. I see he's been taking notes from Madara. The people of the tribe are in disarray panic as the mountain of a familiar descends. All while Gao Peng sits atop him with a smug look. The tribe patriarch's giant white serpent familiar suddenly bursts from the ground to defend them but it's hardly a threat to Stripey, who crushes it with his fall alone. With the whole area cleared, Gao Peng mentally thanked Kong Xiong for the info about the kidnapped people being in a reinforced area underground. Thanks to that, he can let loose without worrying about collateral damage. Suddenly, the patriarch's white serpent reels back up and attacks Gao Peng himself with unbridled fury. As Gao Peng states though, that fury and hatred blind it to the simple fact that Stripey is still the superior here. Something that's proven when he crushes the serpent yet again. Next, Stripey searches the rubble of his crash for more familiars and crushes them all at Gao Peng's instructions. With most of the area crushed, Gao Peng is left to wonder why the serpent is the only overlord tier familiar that came to fight them. After all, they're supposed to have two, and he'd rather crush them both here than wait for one to come for revenge later. Regardless, his priority here is to save the kidnapped girls. As such, he sends in his familiars and tells them to kill any from the Yuhu tribe that get in their way. In one area, some survivors of Stripey's crash try to escape through the trees and regroup. Unfortunately for them, their rides are sliced apart and their lives are left hanging by a thread as they're stalked like prey. The Predator? One of Gao Peng's dragon ant babies is in camouflage mode. With this, the fifth baby with a specialty of stealth is the hidden dragon ant. At level 66, he's able to shred through the Yuhu survivors like wet tissues. Gao Peng comes onto the scene to check up on the woman the survivors were trying to escape with and confirms that she's alive. At Gao Peng's command, the hidden dragon ant returns to the tunnel they came from to look for more victims. While he leaves to complete that task, Gao Peng looks up to the sky and spots the reinforcements that were most likely sent earlier. With the second baby DA, He's able to determine that there are seven enemies in total with the leader being a giant black tiger with black lightning all around it. This is most likely the second overlord tier beast. That gets Gao Peng's attention and as such, he summons forth his most passionate fighter to deal with the matter. That's right folks, Goldie's back. And holy crap he's been juicing because the dude's yoked as hell. His personality remains unchanged though, as the buff duck instantly starts acting like a cringe anime role player. 
Gao Peng is terribly sickened by this, as he should be, and tells Goldie to get to work. The familiar simply tells Gao Peng not to worry before launching off of the ground with enough force to create a whole shockwave in his wake. Up in the sky, he leaps from monster to monster. One-shotting each one he passes until he reaches the black tiger itself. As he mocks it by calling it a little kitty, the tiger gets very visibly upset and discharges a metric crap ton of electricity at him. Rather than being hurt by the attack, Goldie takes it in stride and launches himself at the tiger, hitting it with severely damaging punches while tanking more hits. As his barrage of attacks continues, Goldie eventually hits the tiger away with a kick and stands in place with a dual-handed bird flip at the tiger. Said tiger is overwhelmed with shock out easily. The esteemed veteran overlord of the Yu who tried has been humiliated. It's already coughing up blood when Goldie decides to brutalize it further with a devastating blow to the back of the head. The tiger tries to react and launch an attack on Goldie to defend itself, but as usual, his passive skill allows him to just tank all the damage. Probably doesn't help, but the tiger's got two feet in the grave. With his strength increased once more, Goldie pounds the tiger harder than your mom and leaves it a crippled mess. Gao Pum watches this with a small grin, knowing that Goldie's higher grade allows him to beat the tiger despite being lower leveled. With that taken care of, he takes off to go check in with Streppy. The giant mountain ruler is currently crushing the white serpent under his mass, though the snake is still struggling somehow. Gao Peng tells Strippy to go ahead and show the snake what he's got. As soon as he's got the approval, Strippy digs into the ground under him and positions himself to become what's essentially an organic oven. By expending the heat his body is capable of producing directly into the ground below him, he's cooking the serpent like a tray of lasagna. Gao Peng reminisces about how they discovered this technique for cooking monster meat just half a year ago in the Black Fa world. Knowing the perfect person to call for this next part, Gao Peng summons Da Zi. With how powerful he is now, his lightning bolts dwarf those of the lightning tiger Goldie just destroyed. The centipede dragon with a superior lightning control and grade is called forth, only to immediately start looking for whatever smells so good. Dude's always on the prowl for some good grub. I get it. Impatient is all hell. Da Zi tells Strippy to move his fat booty so he can speed up the cooking process. As soon as Strippy gets off the serpent and allows it some breathing room, it thinks that someone has arrived to rescue it from this hell. The serpent's in the middle of a real long-winded internal monologue about never giving up hope when Da Zi rains down a lightning bolt more intense than anything he's seen so far. So much for getting rescued. On the side of the Yuhu spatial rift that's on Earth, several transportation trucks arrive at once. One man emerges from them, seeming to be the head of the caravan, and tells the head soldier that they've brought the latest batch of girls to send into the rift. The lead soldier has different plans, though. Between his own disgust with what he's allowing to happen, Gao Peng's promise to end the Yuhu tribe today, and just his own morality winning out, he tells the truck guy to send the girls back to wherever they were kidnapped from. The truck driver insists that they'll all be killed by you, who if that happens, but the lead soldier tells him he'll cover it with a story about how monsters attack the transport caravan. The truck driver is just about to argue back even more when one of the other soldiers announces that someone's coming out of the spatial rift. The men are braced for whatever may exit the rift, but they're left stunned when the ones to emerge are the very girls who were kidnapped and sent inside before now. The soldiers are instantly ordered to help the injured women and get them settled so they can be taken home. One of the soldiers asked a woman what happened in the Ji Yuli wilderness and how they escaped. She answers that a kind man saved them with his overlord tear familiars. The lead soldier is even more stunned than before if that's possible. As far as he knows, King Tears are the pinnacle of beasts, so what kind of existence could be an overlord? Right as he thinks this, Gao Peng emerges from the rift as well with a finger held up to his smiling lips to signal silence. Before the soldier can ask any questions, Gao Peng has already taken off atop one of his dragon ants, leaving behind a group of grateful women and amazed soldiers. Up in the air, Gao Peng thinks about how he was lucky the Yuhu tribe didn't have any Saint Tier familiars. Dummy should be getting to that point before long now since he was already at level 80 when Gao Peng left the Black Fa world. From what Fishy told him, Saint Tears gain a halo in a domain that suppresses other lower leveled monsters of the same element. Gao Peng just hopes he can get one soon so he can have more confidence while facing the ancient tribes. Oh, and he has a bunch of those meteorite ball thingies to play with now. That night, Tong Xiang can barely get a wink of sleep in his panic over the situation with Gao Peng. If he gets taken out by the Yu Hu they trace him back to Xiang, his life will be over without any doubt. He's just regretting telling him what he knew in the heat of the moment when he suddenly gets a phone call from his father. 
The older Tong asks Xiang if he's in Mo Du and then asks if Xiang has done anything to piss off Gao Peng. When Xiang answers in the negative, his father breathes a sigh of relief and tells him that spies recovered footage four hours ago of a concerning event. Gao Peng has wiped out the Yuhu tribe. With one last bit of advice to try and befriend Gao Peng, his father cuts the call, leaving his son to freak out over Gao Peng's brutality and power. All over the world, similar calls are being made as the news of Gao Peng's feats spreads. Before morning, everyone knows of his seemingly unbeatable power. The next day, the National High School Championship Finals begins between Tianga Academy and Huwa Wu High School. As the match goes on, the Tianga students are overjoyed by how well the fight is going for them. Yao Peng, on the other hand, is rather annoyed. As far as he can tell, and can tell all right. The opponent team seems to be losing on purpose. Between that and the tournament staff offering him a private suite, he can tell what's happening and he's less than happy about it. His annihilation of the Yuku tribe has become public knowledge and now everyone is bending over backwards to gain his favor. Something which only frustrates him as the Huwa Wuhai team soon forfeits the match. Though he puts on a smile for his students who are celebrating unaware of the situation, Gao Peng finds the whole situation insulting as he knows his students would have won even if their opponents went all out. With things as they are now, he's planning to stay cooped up in his lab for a while to get the public's attention off of him. Because that'll totally work. Not like he just committed mass murder or anything. Even if they did have it coming. A couple of days have passed with Gao Peng cooped up in his lab behind the villa, just as he said he would be. During his time, he's managed to sort out the company's main familiars. White Dragon, Silver Dragon, and the blood eye bearded Vulture have all been promoted to Emperor Tier. White Dragon in particular shot up to level 64 and his combat power skyrocketed. All that's left is to wait for the Secret Realm to open so he can acquire the True Dragon Fruit to promote White Dragon to Legendary Grade. Right as he's pondering the current state of the world since the level limiter has been raised, Gao Peng is informed that he has guests. Knowing that normal guests wouldn't even be allowed far enough for news of them to reach his ears, Gao Peng wonders who they could be. Probably someone important, I'm guessing. Sure enough, the man Gao Peng is led to meet is clearly someone of status, apparent from both his appearance and the bodyguard with him. Gao Peng greets him with an offer of tea that he has the red snow tea plant monster chews very meticulously. Though the old man's bodyguard tries to butt in and stop this, the old man himself tells him it's fine. He graciously accepts the tea and has some before praising it. With that done, he tells Gao Peng they can cut the formalities and all that crap and just get to the point. Well, alright, alright, alright. That's something I can get behind. First and foremost, he tells Gao Peng he wants to express his gratitude and does so while bowing down. His bodyguard once more is perturbed by this, but he continues. He tells Gao Peng that he only found out of the kidnapped women after the incident where Gao Peng wiped out Yu Hu. The men involved have been locked up and stripped of their familiar rights too. Gao Peng tries to divert the man's attention and tells him that these talks can be had with his grandpa since he's really just a young guy not cut out for such things. Right as he's finishing this statement, the old man tells him that the Southern Sky Group will no longer have to pay any taxes. Whoa holy crap, sign me up two gramps. Gao Peng tries to show some humility and sheepishly says that he doesn't deserve such a thing. When the old man praises him and tells him he can keep paying them then, Gao Peng almost loses his lunch. Luckily, the old geezer is just messing with him. That aside, it's time to talk about what he came here for in truth. He has a favorite ask of Gao Peng. A few days later, several buses and trucks arrived at Shennan Jia. While waiting for someone to join them, some men dressed as scientists complain about who this mystery person is. One of them speculates it's the trainer from Southern Sky who recently got a ton of attention, only to get scolded by a senior since Gao Peng is just behind them. Luckily, he's busy thinking back to how he got here. The old man from the other day informed him of a passageway soon to open in Shennong Jia. They set up an expedition to explore it and have employed him as their security for it. With the severe shortage of competent specialists, the man pretty much had to turn to Gao Peng and promise him rights over anything he finds inside. From what Gao Peng remembers the old man telling him, the higher ups of the world actually discovered signs of the cataclysm decades before it happened but kept it a secret from the public for their own gain. The passage in Shennong Jia is likely one that leads to a pocket dimension with a high concentration of spiritual energy. Gao Peng suspects this dimension has been sucking away their planet's spiritual energy. Just then, new players appear in the sky above. Members of the Qing Luan tribe who are here to join them. 
With level 68, Emperor Tyr familiars as mere steeds and their tribe being one of the great seven who are far stronger than Yu Hu and Sun Tang. They have Gao Peng more than a little on edge. Strangely enough, Bei Qingyan is here to look after Gao Peng as repayment for freeloading at his grandpa's place. Though he's a little peeved since his grandpa's motivations for this are obvious, Gao Peng admits Bei is more knowledgeable than him so she'll likely be quite helpful. Gao Peng is wondering if the seven great tribes have Saint Tyr familiars when their departure is announced. With everyone gathered, they head to the site of the Spatial Rift. There, they find a massive crack in reality itself, leading to a deadened version of the same land they're in. The scientists are debating over whether it's a Spatial Rift or not while Gao Peng just casually walks in. Once inside, he's surprised to find that it feels like the world limit was just lifted. That means there could be Overlord Tears here. Right as he has this thought, a terrified scream rings out from behind him. One of the scientists is being chased by a monster that just spawned right out of the ground. The scientist being chased yells for help as the monster closes in on him. Just as it's about to catch him, one of the security forces sends in his familiar, an ice bear king. It crushes the monster with ease, saving the scientist's life, but they're not quite out of the woods yet. Just when they're relaxing over it being a low-level monster, dozens more start emerging from the ground beneath them, clawing their way out of the soil like the souls of the damned themselves. The scientists and monster trainers are on the verge of freaking out, but the leader of the security force manages to rally them with a reassurance that they're individually weak monsters. While the monster trainers defend the scientists, Yao Peng is standing by one of the dead-looking trees in the area and closely studying it. Bully Peng just missed the part where that's his problem. The monsters spawning right now are Commander Tier at most, but these trees are far more concerning to him because the system has no response to them. Despite that, they give off a strange chill he can't quite shake. Gao Peng summons Flamey to help with an experiment in Holy Yakatori. What happened to him? Why is he so fat? Gao Peng studies the tree closer to Flamey's power and determines that it has an aura of soul power, something Flamey's fire appears to inflict heavier damage on. In the background, Flamey gets asked by another familiar why he's so damn fat and he plays it off as a metabolism thing. Back with the others, the hostile monsters have all been cleared out and they're ready to keep moving once everyone's ready. One of the scientists spots a flower that's never been seen before and instantly rushes to interact with it without a hint of caution. You think a scientist would know better. As he's observing it, he even comments that it looks strange while trying to dig it up. Gao Peng finally notices what's happening and after a quick look at the flower's stat window, he yells at the scientists to get away from it. Unfortunately, he's too slow and ends up being completely vaporized by a burst of lasers from the flower, leaving behind nothing but a skeleton. That's yikes. All right. Another of the scientists starts raging at the flower for taking his friend's life and tries to rush its way and destroy it. My brother in Christ, were you not paying attention to what just happened? The others are just barely able to hold him back and make sure he doesn't get himself deleted as well. With more than two accidents within half a day since coming here, Gao Peng asks Commander Li to let him scout out the path ahead from the sky before they move further. With Li's approval, Gao Peng takes to the sky aboard Flamey. A few minutes later, he discovered that the layout of this place was pretty much constant all the way through to hundreds of miles out. He suddenly notices a bird flying next to them and checks out its stat window. Shockingly enough, if what the system is saying is to be believed, then this bird is an inhabitant of the Nihi underworld. That is to say, they're literally in hell right now. Yao Peng finds that to be shocking, but also believable considering the environment. He turns around to return to the others with his info. As he's turning, the undead bird tries to attack them but is quickly dealt with via a burst of fire from Flamey. Get cooked. Back with the others, Gao Peng tells Li that their surroundings are the same as here for hundreds of miles ahead so they'll need to prepare themselves. One of the scientists, arguably the only sensible one, suggests they take measurements of the environment's temperature and humidity first so they have as much information as possible. The monster trainers hired as security are enraged by this though and claim that they're all the precaution the group will need. Even worse, one of the scientists agrees with them and wants to move ahead. Gao Peng takes note that the only ones being rowdy right now are pretty weak themselves and likely just want to get a shot at some glory. The stronger trainers from the Qing Luan tribe actually have troubled looks on their faces as they remain silent. Curious to know if the ancients know something more about this place, Gao Peng remembers that he has one of those on his side whom he can just ask. Time to put that head of Bei Qingyan to use. Ayo. Pause. Now Peng tries to signal Bei Qingyan to share the info in question with him using signs for some reason. Unfortunately, she completely misreads him and pulls out some chocolate to offer him instead. Why not just use words? 
A few minutes later, Commander Lee is losing any hope of keeping the group united thanks to the argument that's been brewing, stepping up to the man. Gao Peng asks why he doesn't just let everyone go their own way. He tells Gao Peng that they're supposed to be exploring this place as one group, and if anyone gets hurt then that'll be on his head. Gao Peng is quick to point out though that forcing them all to stay in a group at this point will be the furthest thing possible from efficiency. With everyone having a different opinion on what they should be doing, it will be impossible to manage the group. Despite his own concerns, Commander Li has to admit Gao Peng is right. As such, he announces that everyone is free to explore according to their own wishes as long as they meet back here in a week's time. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of them will make it back. Totally. Yeah, no. For sure. Pretty much as soon as he's finished saying his piece, the monster trainers and more reckless scientists rush off into the east and west to look for glory, fortune, and power. Gao Peng and Bei are moving in a particular direction themselves, too, and he invites Commander Li to join them along with whoever else would like to. And so, Gao Peng, Bei, Commander Li, and some of the more sensible scientists set out together. At one point, one of the scientists gets close to a tree to study its composition. Right as he's doing this, a monster bursts out of hiding and attempts to grab him but is burned away by Flamey's fire at the last moment. The scientist sincerely thanks Gao Peng and his familiar, to which he just asks him to please be more careful. Unknown to the others, Flamey and Gao Peng already knew about the monster, but let him make the first move so the scientists would understand the danger this place posed. Suddenly, the same guy who was studying the tree spots a giant mansion to the side from where they're walking. Gao Peng is both confused and suspicious by the presence of a building in this sort of place but agrees to go over and take a look. Once they're closer, the scientists are able to practically feel how suspicious the mansion is. One of them is all but certain they even saw movement inside but there's no way to prove it. The oldest of the scientists speaks up and tells them they must have the courage to explore as proper scientists. But the sudden movement of the mansion freezes them all in their spots with fear. From behind them, Yao Peng notices that the building looks oddly paper-like. When Flamey mentions there's heavy yin energy radiating from inside it, Yao Peng uses the system to study the building. Surprisingly, the building has a stat window and it's actually a paper mache manner of the King Tier. Why? Just why? Freaking everything's a monster at this point. Now that he knows what it is, Gao Peng tells the scientists they absolutely shouldn't enter it. When they seem doubtful, Gao Peng tells them he can't guarantee his protection when monsters above the Emperor Tier show up, his flamey blow away the top of the manor, revealing the monstrous inside and proving that the manor itself is in fact alive. Or undead, I guess. Gao Peng instantly burns it to ashes, leaving the scientist's request to dissect it unanswered. To Gao Peng's bemusement, the guy just collects some of the ashes instead. Suddenly, the group hears a voice yelling out for help. Raising their eyes to the source of it, they see one of the trainers from the Qing Luan tribe flying their way at a breakneck pace, as they spot the giant mass of darkness following behind. They hear him yell that an overlord tier monster is chasing after them, because nobody could see that damn thing themselves. As the tribe member lands near the group, Yao Peng tells them all to get out of his way and stay back. In front of him, two massive green glowing orbs stare out from a mountain's worth of dust and smoke. Yao Peng realizes electricity should deal increased damage on yin energy, so he calls out Da Zi and tells him to use silver lightning. Even a centipede himself can practically feel how menacing their opponent is, but he obliges and fires off the attack. As the lightning crashes into the beast, the smoke clears up and staggered backwards from the sudden shock. The figure within the smoke is revealed to be a massive sword wielding Minotaur of gargantuan proportions. Once it brings its blade down in anger to clear the area, Gao Peng is able to examine the creature's status window. And oh boy, it's one hell of a stat window. Suffice to say, there's no way in hell he can fight this thing. A saint tier beast. And protect the group as well. Gao Peng is racking his brain for a way to fight the thing off. Wishing Dumby was here to help buy time. The scientist is on the ground, moments away from crapping himself in fear. The Minotaur is standing in place, looking at them with a confused look and no more hostility. Wait, what? The Minotaur speaks out in their tongue and asks what living humans are doing here. Gao Peng jumps on this lifeline and tells the being that they accidentally stumbled in here through a strange passageway that they found and they're very sorry if they disturbed him. As far as he's concerned, talking this out is the safest and realistically, the only option for them since the Minotaur is intelligent. Well, in a very basic sense at least. After hearing Gao Peng's explanation about how they ended up here, the Minotaur admits that they've just been unlucky and the problem isn't all that severe. The solution is pretty simple too. 
Since living humans aren't allowed to enter this place, they'll just have to stay here forever for preaching it. How the hell does that make any sense? Gao Peng and his group are, understandably, absolutely horrified upon hearing this. Before the despair can truly set in though, another being makes itself known. A humanoid horse steps out of the smoke and asks the minotaur, or ox head as he's called, if he's found the problem. This new monster, horse face as the system calls him, curiously messes with Da Zi's wings to see what that's about. The centipede instantly retreats behind Gao Pong upon feeling the pain and starts crying about how this place is scary. Ah jeez, that's just sad. While Gao Pong ponders how much stronger a horse face must be than an ox head, the two monsters in question are having a talk about their intruders. Upon confirming that they are in fact living humans, horse face tells ox head to just chase them back out the way they entered since they barge in by mistake. Oh nice, I didn't know he was chill like that. Horseface stomps his foot on the ground, causing dozens of ghostly souls to be summoned from the soil. These undead beings will go out and find the other humans currently in the underworld before bringing them back here so they can all leave together. While the scientists are of differing opinions and suspicions, Gao Peng and the Qing Luan tribe members are in agreement that the best course of action is to comply and get out of there with their lives. About half an hour later, the undead souls return with all the other scientists and monster trainers tightly held in their ghostly grip. Once the terrified humans are deposited next to the rest of them, Horseface tells Oxhead it's time to send them the hell back. And so, the expedition comes to a close and the Minotaur leads the humans back to the entrance they came from. As always though, there are a couple of troublemakers who think they're smarter than everyone else. One older dude tries to talk a scientist into slipping away quietly and exploring this place while these giants are busy with the others. Horseface is quick to make it known that he can hear everything though as he announces a warm welcome for anyone who wishes to remain in hell. Gao Peng just looks back at them with distaste and comments that the ignorant truly are the most fearless. Damn, didn't have to cook them like that. A few days later, Gao Peng and Grandpa Ji are finally spending some relaxing time together. While Ji fishes for some catch, Gao Peng explains everything that happened in the pocket dimension. Grandpa Ji praises him for taking the smart approach and not acting rashly in the face of superior opponents. That aside, he's curious if Gao Peng is going to head back to the Black Fog world tomorrow. Gao Peng confirms that that's the case and his preparations have already been made, but he's hesitant to go since he's barely spent any time with Ji in forever. That's so again wholesome. W Granson. Ji is quick to assure him though that he doesn't need to worry about things like that. He should just focus on exploring the increasingly vast world they find themselves in. That statement reminds Gao Peng about something he intended to ask Bei about. Luckily, she sat right next to them munching on some KEC. Definitely not KFC. He asks if she can explain what she mentioned before in more detail. When she asks what he'd like to know, Grandpa Ji jumps in and asks about G-U-T and shi -Gi. It's something he's been very interested in ever since Gao Peng mentioned it. Bei explains that what they've seen on Earth is a fraction of the universe. Tons of other worlds are hidden on the other side. Other side of what? She explains that this world itself used to be called G-U-T and shi -Gi. The sky was Yang. The Earth Yin and the Huan Kuan Hell was the legendary shi -Gi. GUTN is a vast world equivalent to what they call a continent. Her northern ice tribe resided in the Frost Archipelago in GUTN, which was independent of Shi D back in the day. The only way to travel between them was a special tunnel, which she never actually saw. Until their recent trip, she'd only ever heard of Shi D in stories from her seniors. She goes on to talk about super strong monster communities in GUTN older than her tribe itself, and how the worlds the ancient tribes flood to are separate from GUTN Shi D. They're known as the Sea of Plains of Existence. That's about all she knows. Gao Peng has just one more question. Why did the ancient tribes leave Earths so long ago? Bei tells him the only ones who left were the old and weak. Her father remained behind along with many seniors in the tribe and went to fight in the war with their familiars. Hold up, war? What war? Gao Peng has that reaction too, only for Ji to scold him for bringing up bad memories for Bei. Well, come on, it was just getting good. As Ji catches a fish and Bai goes to marvel at it, Gao Peng is left to think about all he's heard. All signs point to the fact that the ancients were forced into exile by some outside force. As much as he wants to spend time with his grandpa right now, Gao Peng believes it's his duty to prepare for danger to protect their peace. In the Black Fog world, Fishy emerges from the sea in front of a lone island adorned with massive bones. He informs Dumby that he's found a clue to his lost treasure, and is about to ask him for help with getting it back when Dumby notices a new presence. Their master has returned. Sure enough, Da Zi can be seen in the sky above. 
Without wasting a second, Dumby snitches on Fishy and tells Gao Pong about the treasure he just mentioned. Gao Pong is more than a little peeved by how the fish was trying to retrieve something like that behind his back and snarks at Fishy for it. The familiar in question instantly leaps out of the water and flies up to Gao Pong before claiming that he only just remembered it right now and doesn't even have it yet. Grossed out by the fish's attempt to be cute, Gao Pong tells it to explain what the treasure is. Fishy tells him it's actually a weapon, which confuses Gao Pong since he didn't think monsters would use those. Frosty explains that they normally don't since their bodies are stronger than most weapons, but there are certain ones that are in fact used. Gao Pong is reminded of the weapons wielded by Ox Head and Horse Face and realizes he's right. Even so, he can't imagine what kind of weapon a limbless fish like Fishy could possibly use. A helmet, maybe? Fishy is quick to reject that idea, though, and tells him that it's actually an artifact. Hearing this, Gao Pong decides it's worth his time and tells his familiars to head inside the palace so they can talk about this further in a more comfortable setting. Inside the palace, Gao Pong and his familiars sit at a round table to discuss the latest development. Goldie is beyond frustrated to find out that Fishy's lost treasure is actually a divine artifact. He's pissed that Fishy's actually rich as hell, and he instantly starts being a suck up offering compliments and a full body massage to the fish. Huh, I guess Goldie's short for Gold Digger. Meanwhile, Yao Pong is thinking about how it makes sense Fishy would be some kind of special being since his name is hidden by the system, not to mention his weirdly strong abilities. Frosty, as if hearing his thoughts, explains that a divine artifact is a weapon used by the gods. Each artifact is one of a kind because it contains a god's principle and each god can only create one of them. This makes Gao Peng wonder if Fishy is actually some kind of god, but he discards that thought just for how tiny he is. Getting to the point, he states that Fishy was asking for Dumby's help to get the artifact despite being level 79 himself. So with that in mind, is the monster holding his treasure a St. Tier monster? Fishy casually tells him it's not. No, it's a quasi-god actually. Gao Peng empties the contents of his mouth all over Da Zi in shock before proceeding to beat the crap out of Fishy for even daring to ask for help on such a suicide mission. After tolerating the abuse for a bit, Fishy asks Gao Peng in an unimpressed tone if him knowing the quasi god's weakness would change things. Gao Peng is interested, but he maintains that knowing its weakness doesn't change the fact that they're too weak to actually exploit it. Fishy persists, though, and tells Gao Peng that he left a mark on his weapon that can make it attack whoever is holding it at critical moments. Now that catches Gao Peng's attention. When Fishy tells him he can make his decision after checking out the monster for himself, he's got little reason left to refuse. And so, the pair find themselves traversing the depths of the ocean, Fishy by himself and Gao Peng in a bubble of air. On their way to the monster's location, Gao Peng sparks up a conversation with Fishy about the nature of quasi-gods and their difference from St. Tears. Fishy explains that apart from having a vastly superior domain slash territory, the main difference is the title of god itself. Quasi-gods are also called semi-gods because the power within them has peaked and touched the threshold of a god. Gao Peng correctly deduces that this is when defecation starts, slowly affecting some of the organs and spreading out to the whole body over a very long period of time. When Gao Peng tries to ask more about the difference between a quasi-god and a true god, Fishy tells him that it's so far beyond and right now there's no point in even knowing about it. Well, that's kind of a fishy thing to say. He. Get it? As their conversation comes to an end, Gao Peng notes that the light here at the bottom of the sea is dimmer than ever and he can't really see much. Suddenly, he's startled by a massive hand coming from the side to grab a bunch of giant seaweed. Fishy is quick to assure Gao Peng he's safe since that monster is a vegetarian. At least, that's what he thought. But when the monster's hand comes back their way to grab them this time, they run out of pure instinct and fear. Fishy manages to hit the monster with an attack that slows it down a bit allowing them to put even more distance between them. Now that he has some breathing room, Yao Pan notices the beast's status window which identifies it as a four-armed Jia Luo Sea King beast at level 84 and Saint Tier. Seeing the tier, Gao Pang asks Fishy if he made some kind of mistake, but the answer he gets is even more concerning. This thing isn't the monster they're here for. That one's actually chasing this monster down. Oh. Oh. That can't be good. Sure enough, a humanoid creature with some sort of container on its shoulder walks up to the Sea King beast from behind. Once it's close, the creature blows a large chunk of the Sea King's body apart with a single jab of its finger. Even more shocking though is when this creature lifts the container on its shoulder and tosses it at the Sea King. Within moments, the thing expands to thousands of times its original size and is about to trap the two of them inside it along with the Sea King. It is only Gao Peng's instant reaction and Fishy's skills 
that allow them to escape with their lives intact in the nick of time. As the humanoid quasi-god collects the container and steps away from the area, Gao Peng asks Fishy if he's absolutely sure that's the one. He confirms that he could sense the aura of his divine artifact on it, so it definitely has it and must be trying to refine it right now. With a jolt, Fishy suddenly grows angry and realizes the monster is capturing other powerful ones to perform a ritual to contaminate his artifact's sacredness and make it his own by force. As he rages at this fact, Gao Peng tells him they should just leave. Regardless of how unfortunate it is, they just can't do anything in this scenario. For now, rather than complaining, Gao Peng suggests eating another two monster crystal cores to make himself stronger and come back later. As he says that, he finally gets to see this monster's stat window. Known as the Marine Lurker, it's a level 91 with a ton of poison effects and skills. Gao Peng suggests finding a white starlight tusk elephant's tusk as it can counter the Marine Lurker's water prison. Fishy admits that that would nullify like 70% of the Marine Lurker's power, but unfortunately, he's never heard of such a thing. With that not being an option, Gao Peng tries to think up some other strategies. After a couple of moments of thought, he tells Fishy they can use a borrowed sword approach of sorts. That is to say, getting someone else to do the fighting for them. Gao Peng asks Fishy if he knows any other quasi-gods they can make use of to that end. To his continued shock, Fishy says he knows three of them. Wu Zhiqi is an incredibly powerful being who's the basis for the legendary tale of Sun Wukong. The Windstorm Water Magic Spider and finally, the Deep Sea Covered Mountain Giant. Gao Peng wants to get one of them to fight the Marine Lurker so that both entities end up injured and weakened. Then, the two of them can swoop in and steal back Fishy's treasure. Unfortunately, two of the three quasi-gods are out of the question right off the bat. In the case of Wu Zhiqi, it's because he's so low-key nobody can find him. And in the case of the Windstorm Water Magic Spider, it's because the quasi-god is Fishy's illegitimate child. What now? So apparently that's a thing. Between Fishy's bad relationship with his child and the fact that their shared blood will make it easier for the spider to steal his artifact and refine it for himself, it's definitely not a viable option. That just leaves the deep sea covered mountain giant. Luckily, Fishy is almost completely certain he knows where that quasi-god is sleeping and there's no particularly bad blood between them either. With their unwitting ally chosen, the two head out to set things into motion. About half a day later, Gao Peng and Fishy are at the undersea mountain range where their ally is supposed to be sleeping. Floating atop the water's surface, they continuously bombard the seabed with sea urchin bombs from Fishy to try and get the mountain giant to wake up from its slumber. Gao Peng is just starting to question if this is actually going to work when the surface of the water suddenly becomes restless. Within moments, the two are forced to retreat as the mountain giant awakens and rises. They get away just in time too as just the sheer output of power and the movement of the mountain giant causes the sea level itself to collapse. Yeah, this is definitely more than a match for the mountain lurker. The end, for now.